Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a tour of a binary phase diagram so we can learn a little bit about exactly what they are and what kind of information we can get out of them. Shown here is a phase diagram, the likes of which you've probably seen many times during general chemistry. It has a pressure and temperature axis and three fields for the common phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. And of course, the transition between solid and liquid would be for the processes that we commonly know as freezing and melting. But what's interesting about this is that we don't have to necessarily use pressure and temperature as the axes for our phase diagram. Instead, let's project a third axis into and out of the plane of your screen. And we'll call that axis composition. So now I've created a three-dimensional plot in Cartesian space. And if I want to look at the effect of composition on the temperature of transitions at any given pressure, I simply have to choose one pressure. Let's choose one atmosphere since that's the pressure we typically work at in lab. Now I can simply slice through my, my new diagram at that pressure And when I do this, I create a face which now has composition and temperature axes at one atmosphere of pressure. And the phase diagram looks quite different than what we're used to seeing for pure compounds. Now if I were to have turned that cube so that the face that interests me was pointing directly at us, we'd see something like this, what's known as a binary phase diagram where we now have an axis of temperature and one of composition instead of pressure and temperature. And when we do this, we get some interesting fields that we don't normally see in the phase diagrams of pure substances. Specifically, those yellow colored fields where we have liquid and solid coexisting over a range of temperatures. Now, if you Google on the web for a binary phase diagram, you'll find a broad range of phase diagrams for a broad range of systems, some of which are very simple and others of which are incredibly complicated. So for our purposes, we're going to stick to this very simple idealized phase diagram that I've created for you here. So now that we've had a look at this binary phase diagram, let's consider how it is built. To construct our binary phase diagram, we'll start with a pure material. Let's begin with our green square compound here. If I'm interested in the melting point of that pure compound, I can find it at the extreme left-hand side of my phase diagram. Because it's pure, we expect there to be only one single temperature at which solid and liquid can coexist. So as I heat a sample of this compound, I simply heat solid until I reach the melting temperature the melting transition then takes place at that temperature, and once it is complete, then I begin heating my liquid. But if I begin to mix in a small amount of a second compound, for example, my compound uh, which is depicted by red triangles here, I see two important changes in the phase boundary. The first is that it goes downward. The melting point goes down when I add small amounts of my new compound to the mixture. And the second interesting characteristic is that it does not melt at a single temperature anymore, but rather over a range of temperatures. So I can take a mixture of my red and green, let's say, at this composition and heat the solid until a liquid begins to form. But as that melting process takes place, the temperature still changes, it goes up. So there's a range of temperatures over which this mixture of compounds can melt. And we call this process incongruent melting. And it's caused by the fact that as my mixture melts, one compound preferentially enters a liquid phase faster than the other. So the composition of the melting solid is continually changing as the process is taking place, thereby manifesting itself as a melting range rather than a melting point. And of course, if I continue heating once melting is complete, I simply heat the liquid again. 
So at this point, we can think of this part of the diagram as my red compound acting as an impurity in my green compound. But eventually, I reach a confluence somewhere near the middle of the diagram, though not necessarily directly in the middle as I've depicted it here. When this happens, we've reached what's known as the eutectic point. You'll notice that the eutectic point is the only point so far besides pure green compound at which we have a single melting transition temperature. And it's also the lowest melting transition temperature possible. And this is the origin of the name eutectic. It's taken from Greek terms, meaning easy and melting. So the eutectic mixture of these two is expected to melt at a single temperature and also at the lowest temperature for any mixture of the two compounds. As I continue to add more and more red compound to my mixture, I'll see my melting point begin to increase again, eventually reaching the melting point of the pure red compound. So I've created another region of my diagram where liquid and solid can coexist, but this time because of the green compound acting as an impurity in the red, as opposed to vice versa. And of course, as my concentration comes closer and closer to 100% red, I ultimately approach its melting point and we finally reach it at 100% red compound. So this is how we can think of binary phase diagrams as simply being the contamination of one compound with another until we reach a eutectic and then turning the tables on its head and having a compound acting as the impurity. That's all for this short introduction to binary phase diagrams. If you're interested in seeing more content, why not hop on over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash chemsurvival for even more videos. That's it for now everyone. I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com and the YouTube channel Chemsurvival. See you in the next video.